morning, guys. Uh, my name is Al Vitale. Um, I am a uveitis and retina person here, and today we're going to kind of give you an overview of the general principles and epidemiology, classification, diagnostic approach, and treatment of uveitis. There's a lot in this lecture. Uh, I don't expect you to absorb it all, but it will give you actually a pretty good overview uh, of the topic and an approach. So some of you know me. Many of you don't, so um, I thought I would just give you a little introduction of where I'm coming from. So in a previous life, I spent about seven years in Saudi Arabia, uh, doing very much what I do here in uveitis and in uh, vitreo retinal disease. But in actual fact, I'm a wild animal trainer, uh, along with my wife, uh, uh, four kind of monkeys that are pictured here. Uh, these are my kids, and this was uh, these are triplets, and uh, this was taken uh, at Kennedy Airport uh, the day that we left for Saudi Arabia. And my son seems to be looking at me like, are you sure you know what we're getting into here? And I said, yeah, yeah, it's really cool. I mean, you know, we've got ultra-modern living facilities. It's really, really great. Uh, you're going to really enjoy them. And they have the gigantic sandbox out there. Uh, this is actually uh, about a mile outside, uh, rather an hour outside of Riyadh, Saudi Arabia. And it's, it's very reminiscent of southern Utah, I think, but uh, the, these large sand deserts, and we used to go out there with our kids and hopefully not get them lost, which was easy to do, actually. We used to go camping in the desert a lot, and this is my wife, and uh, we got an um, opportunity to come out to Utah and to interview here, and I said, yeah, we got this chance to go out to Utah, and she's kind of looking at me like, what is with you, okay? You came from, you know, from one state where it's dry to another, uh, to desert to desert, to, you know, kind of fundamentalism and religious conservatism <laughs> and polygamy. I mean, you know, I mean, is there something going on here? I said, no, but really, you know, the desert bloom here is, uh, you know, much more beautiful than it is in Saudi Arabia. Um, this is actually a shot outside my front door. Uh, when we first moved there, uh, you will see that in the wintertime, uh, it looks similar, but there are a few more houses, and any of you who were up at my house last weekend knows that there are a lot more houses in our neighborhood now. So we enjoy the four seasons of, that Utah has to offer. Um, there was a time when I, I used to go skiing with my kids, and you know, I used to say, well, follow me, guys, you know, and uh, this is my son crossing some eights, um, but now the most dangerous words on the hill are, follow me, dad, uh, so which I would never do, and my kids like to get you know, a lot of air and get upside down. Um, they seem to like dangerous sports. Uh, notice, you know, the uh, protective shoes here. Uh, anyway, and this is my son, uh, Ryan, who does competitive longboarding, uh, which is kind of like, you know, downhill skiing on cement. Um, and if you really want an entertaining video on a warm-up run, check this video out on YouTube, uh, When Reindeer Attack, uh, collision at about 45 miles an hour with a, with a deer as he's coming down this road. Uh, my girls are into more expensive hobbies uh, like uh, horse riding and competitive horse jumping and stuff like that. Um, my son and I like to go surfing. We're headed there actually tomorrow uh, down to Mexico. Um, these are my kids kind of growing up now, uh, 20 and uh, 21 or 21 and a half. Um, our house is, at least for the for the uh, moment, empty nest, which is actually very nice, and my boys are now the, our two dogs, and my wife and I are still doing okay, crazy after all these years, or being driven crazy after all these years by these four guys. Anyhow, so let's back to the topic here, uveitis, okay. So uveitis is Latin for, the, for, uve, for um, uh, grape. In fact, I used to play in a band called Uveal Blues, but that's another story. So uveitis is not actually one disease. It's a, a really a collection of 30 separate entities with uh, distinct clinical features, course and prognosis, and uh, disease-specific indications for treatment. They can, you can broadly think of them as uh, falling into either infectious or non-infectious categories. Um, they are uh, frequently auto-inflammatory or autoimmune in etiology or a neoplastic, uh, masquerade syndromes, and really, um, An etiologic diagnosis is often not very fruitful because really etiology can be proven only, I think, for infectious diseases and certain diseases with Mendelian genetics. Um, it is uh, prevalent, okay? Uh, about 10 to 15 percent of the blindness in the United States is due to uveitis. Um, it's the fifth to sixth 
cause uh, visual loss after diabetes and macular degeneration. The thing that the peak onset is, you know, in the most productive years of life. Uh, so really the personal economic impact of uh, this disease may be even greater than that for age-related diseases. Um, visual loss is not insignificant, okay? So both impairment and blindness occur with fairly high uh, frequencies um, and occur more often in more severe diseases. Uh, as you can see here from, you know, it's less, more prevalent in patients with posterior impanitivitis. So the back of the eye has more blinding disease. So how do we approach a patient with uveitis? Um, as uh, Sir William Osler said, uh, listen to your patient, he's telling you the diagnosis. So a history uh, is actually quite important. Um, as opposed to, uh, you know, the approach maybe uh, in other areas of ophthalmology where it's quick look and, uh, and gone. So the history includes an ophthalmic history, a medical history, and a review of systems that you can elicit uh, while you're talking to the patient or by means of a questionnaire that we frequently will uh, ask the patient to fill out. Uh, then the ocular examination uh, in which the anatomic location and grade severity of the inflammation are assessed, uh, this assessment of structural complications. A general medical exam to the extent that you can, you can uh, perform this in the clinic. Um, so you can uh, you look at the skin, you can look at joints, you can look at deformities, it gives you an idea of what's going on with the patient. And then the key is the formulation of differential diagnosis before you have ordered any laboratory tests. So based on your exam and your history and your review of systems, the formulation of a differential. So how do you form a differential? By really characterizing inflammation um, according, uh, along several dimensions. So where is it located? Where is the anatomic location of the inflammation? Okay, anterior, intermediate, posterior, panuveitis. We'll go over that. What is the presentation? course and laterality. Is it acute? Is it chronic? Monophasic? Unilateral? Bilateral? What is the morphology, location, uh, and number of the lesions, and what are the descriptors that are associated with the lesions? This is important. Is it a retinitis, a choroiditis? Are there a few lesions or are there a lot of lesions? Is it in the posterior pole? Is it in the periphery? Is it granulomatous or non-granulomatous? Then there are host factors that are important. Is it associated with systemic condition that's non-infectious, like sarcoidosis, multiple sclerosis, Bechet's, BKH, or a systemic infectious disease, uh, like syphilis. Um, and what is the uh, health of the patient? What is the immune status of the patient? Because the appearance of diseases will look very different if the patient is immunosuppressed. Okay, so, and that includes not the obvious immunosuppression, the patient with a diagnosis of AIDS, but patients who are relatively immunosuppressed, such as people that are on uh, chemotherapy or elderly patients that are basically are, are uh, winding down their immune system. Then where the, where's the patient from? The world's shrinking, right? Um, so there are certain diseases that are more common in certain parts of the world, and we see them here. There's a large refugee population in Utah. Um, what are the associated symptoms and the associated signs? Okay. Then Based on the differential diagnosis, a directed laboratory investigation is launched to, and the purpose of this is really to exclude infection, and to identify systemic diseases that may impact the, the health of the patient, and to provide prognostic information for the patient, which we'll talk about. And then a treatment plan is formulated uh, with appropriate antimicrobial therapy in the case of a patient with an infectious disease, and then a stepladder algorithm depending upon how severe the disease is. Um, using anti-inflammatory medications in the early implementation of immunomodulatory therapy, uh, which is either first line in certain indications or steroid sparing, to avoid prolonged exposure to chronic corticosteroids. And then, of course, you need to assess your treatment and monitor the side effects and toxicity thereof. So what, how do we, how do we um, categorize the disease anatomically? There's a group that met um, about 10 years ago, uh, the uh, standard, uh, standardization of uveitis nomenclature working group, um, which I was a part of, and uh, publication was uh, generated from this, which I think I encourage you all to read. Um, and basically, it agree, it, you got a bunch of uveitis eggheads in the room in order to kind of agree to agree on what you're talking about. So it's important for communication purposes, research purposes. Um, and then 
identify, and then how do you talk about your patients? So we agreed that we would classify inflammation anatomically. There are other ways to classify it, but where is the predominance of the inflammation? Is it in the anterior chamber, okay, so-called anterior uveitis? Is it intermediate uveitis? That is, is inflammation concentrated more in the vitreous than the peripheral retina? Is it a posterior retinitis, by definition involving the retina or choroid? Or it is the uh, inflammation not distributed in one anatomic department, but, uh, but all three, so-called pan-uveitis. So here are some examples of a hypophion uveitis in a patient with <clears throat> anterior uveitis, intermediate uveitis in which you see cells in the vitreous, okay, posterior uveitis in a patient with toxoplasmosis, where there is a definitive scar on the retina and a satellite lesion of active retinitis, and pan uveitis in a patient with exudative retinal detachment in a patient with VKH syndrome. This um, classification system is okay, uh, but I think that it um, does not include cer certain very important uh, categories of inflammation. Okay, so keratouveitis, uh, inflammation of the um, of the cornea and uh, in the anterior chamber is important category of disease. It is herpetic until proven otherwise. Okay? Um, likewise, sclero uveitis doesn't have a home in the uh, sun uh, nomenclature, but is obviously important because scleritis is important with some type of systemic association about 50% of the time. Okay? Uh, then retinal vasculitis, uh, there was no home for retinal vasculitis either, but retinal vasculitis is a very common accompaniment of uh, intermediate posterior pan uveitis. And it's a very large topic, but in essence it can be primary. You can just have retinal vasculitis, or it can be associated with other inflammatory diseases. And it can predominantly <coughs> affect the arteries or the veins, okay, or bulb. And that's important because certain diseases more commonly will affect the arteries, such as acute retinal necrosis, or the veins, such as sarcoidosis. So it helps you in your differential diagnosis. And then, rarely, uh, but in very important cases, vasculitis can be, can be associated with systemic vasculitic conditions, only in about 1% of patients, but that's important to identify. Then, this may seem simple or even insulting your intelligence, but it's not because um, people, when people talk, when you, when people classify uveitis, they, um, they use terms that really don't make sense. Um, so it's important to know what you're talking about when you say what's an acute uveitis and what is a, a chronic uveitis, you know? Um, a chronic recurrent uveitis doesn't make sense to me, okay? Uh, an acute recurrent uveitis does make sense. So um, the onset of disease is either described as being sudden or insidious, and the duration is either limited or persistent, okay? And arbitrarily, um, a cutoff of three months is designated for you know, the duration, so that an acute uveitis would be something with sudden onset and limited duration, so it's, it has a start and finish, as opposed to recurrent uveitis, which is marked by episodes of inflammation um, in between you know, three months, and then uh, chronic is persistent, which relapses promptly off of therapy. So it's important to have that kind of down. Um, one can also classify uveitis as to whether or not it's granulomas or not granulomas. I think it's a good descriptor, but it isn't very specific, especially for non-granulomas inflammation. But non-granulomas inflammation is pictured here with these small KP uh, on the corneal surface here that are um, nondescript, really, uh, and may occur in many forms of uveitis. Granulomas inflammation, on the other hand, has a different appearance and looks like these stuck on uh, kind of mutton fat type of precipitates. And it is also characterized by nodules on the iris. Okay? So it is important because the differential of patients with granulomatous uveitis is a little more limited. And it would include entities such as sarcoid, sympathetic lens induced disease, and intraocular foreign body, VKH, TB. And note that herpes and syphilis can do anything. Okay? Likewise, this is a busy table, but the reason I put it up there is just to kind of classify the major uva of these along the anatomic axis, okay, and whether or not it's infectious, systemic, or, or uh, there is no systemic disease, it's just an ocular disorder, 
And I just want you to point out that syphilis, you know, can pretty much do anything. Sarcoidosis can pretty much do anything, okay? Um, Lyme disease, again, is spiroketal disease, which, and TB uh, are important thing, things to consider that have multiple uh, presentations. Um, the major uh, diseases uh, that the differential of anterior uveitis are listed here. Um, infectious diseases such as herpes seen here with um, translumination defects and atrophy of the iris. Um, systemic diseases such as HLA B27 associated disease here is a hypopion uveitis associated with that. Um, this is an eye with JIA associated uveitis, a quiet eye with a cataract. Um, this is a patient with sarcoidosis, with mutton fat type of KP. And this is a patient with Fuchs uveitis serum with iris heterochromia. So there's no systemic disease associated with this. Um, the major differential of intermediate uveitis would include infectious diseases such as syphilis and Lyme. Um, systemic diseases would include multiple sclerosis, which is an important consideration, sarcoidosis. And then an idiopathic variety in which there is no associated systemic disease called pars planitis. So when we talk about intermediate uveitis, we talk about intermediate uveitis associated with, you know, whatever systemic condition. If there is no systemic condition, it is termed pars planitis. So intermediate uveitis and pars planitis are not necessarily the same disease, right? Okay. You may have similar manifestations of the disease, but in terms of your nomenclature, you would say intermediate uveitis is associated with MS. Um, if there is no systemic association, pars planitis. So the character, characteristic findings of pars planitis would include uh, macular edema, which is a major cause of visual loss, and these in precipitates or snowballs <coughs> in the vitreous, inflammatory exudates, and retinal vasculitis, as you see clinically and on angiographic, uh, wide field and regular angiography, okay, with leakage and staining. Posterior uveitis, um, I think it's very important to specify and think about what it, where is, what is the primary level of the inflammation? Is it primarily in the retina, such as in toxoplasmic chorioretinitis? Is it primarily in the chorite, like a patient with TB, okay? Then the, the location, the, the number, and the descriptors of the lesion are important in helping you think about the differential diagnosis. So. Are there many of them? Are there a few of them? Is it in the posterior pole, in the periphery, or both? What is the color, the size, and the shape? So just to illustrate this, this is a patient with an, a amoeboid or geographic area of uh, chorioretinitis, so, uh, characteristic of serpiginous chorioretinitis. This is a patient with ampi, with placoid type of lesions, okay? different than the previous one. These are yellow, orange, ovoid lesions in the deep retina and the, the pigment epithelium characterized, uh, uh, characteristic of Burchett retinal chordopathy. In contrast, here are punched out chordal retinal lesions that one sees with multifocal chordiasis and pan uveitis, or even patients with many other diseases such as PIC or histoplasmosis. And then, if you can see them, there are these tiny, evanescent, tiny little white dots here in a patient with mutus multiple evanescent white dot syndrome. So the descriptors are completely different, right? But the descriptors are important in describing what it is that's right here. Um, the major differential in patients with uh, uh, posterior uveitis include infectious diseases such as this patient uh, with CMV retinitis and these other diseases listed here, systemic diseases such as sarcoidosis with this pan uveitic picture with retinal vasculitis, vitritis, choroidal, and retinal lesions. And then those with no systemic disease, this is a patient with a, a kind of a variant of ampi and serpiginous called relentless placoid chorioretinopathy. Then panuveitis, okay? So always think about syphilis, okay, in your differential diagnosis, all right? Syphilis can, this is a patient with syphilis with characteristic pre-retinal um, Exudates. This is a actually a Saudi Arabian woman with an exudative retinal detachment, okay, and leakage in their floor in their on their fluorescein angiogram with pooling 
uh, characteristic of VKH syndrome. And this is a patient with multiple coronal lesions that's very similar to VKH syndrome, except this is a patient that had these lesions in the context of trauma. So this is a diagnosis of sympathetic ophthalmia. So where does that get us? It allows us to talk to each other, okay? So if I am going to say, yeah, I've got this patient with unilateral alternating recurrent anterior uveitis, I'm thinking, you know, likelihood this may be an HLA B27 associated spondyloarthropathy associated disease or, or uh, HLA B27 associated disease. In contrast, a unilateral recurrent focal retinitis, like the picture we saw, unilateral focal retinitis. I'm thinking about toxoplasmosis, okay? But if you tell me, I got this AIDS patient with, you know, chronic focal retinitis, I'm thinking, well, maybe, maybe not. Maybe it's, probably, it could be toxoplasmosis, but it's more likely CMV retinitis. Um, a bilateral multifocal choroiditis with cream colored, with them, um, you know, orange ovoid lesions would be more characteristic of birdshot. So, what do we do when we assess the patient? Obviously, we're in the business of vision, right? So, best corrected visual acuity, I think, is important in the clinic. Uh, intraocular pressure, and then standardized method for grading inflammation. This was another task of the Sun Working uh, Group, and uh, in the paper that I encourage you guys to read. So, we agreed to agree on a classification system in which the anterior chamber cells would be graded on a um, ordinal scale from zero to four plus, depending upon the number of cells that you can actually count, okay, in a one by one millimeter slit, okay? Um, this is a pretty good example of what you see, you know, when you're actually looking uh, at the patient here. Flare, okay, is a proteinaceous uh, material that is extravasated through incompetent blood vessels in the anterior chamber, uh, much like uh, you know, you might see if you went to a movie theater, people, someone was smoking a cigarette, of course, um, and uh, you might see particulate matter in, in projected from the uh, projection booth. And uh, that is graded, on, again, on a zero, scale of zero to four plus, depending upon uh, the degree to which uh, the flare obscures these structures in the anterior chamber. Note that in this classification system, hypopion is not included in this, so that's graded separately. Okay, so four plus flare is a lot of flare with fibrin in the anterior chamber that you might see, for example, in a patient with a postoperative endophthalmitis. Okay, you might also see a hypopion, so you would grade them separately. Uh, a little more tricky and a little less satisfying is uh, the grading of vitreous haze, which, uh, in which the, um, a system has been adopted that had been in place for a while using um, an NEI uh, grading system uh, basing flare on the visibility of structures based on indirect ophthalmoscopy from zero to trace to four plus. So, you know, zero, is, everything is crystal clear, four plus, there are no structures visible. There are obvious problems with this grading system um, because, you know, the vitreous is not the only thing that produces media opacity. So, you have the lens, the cornea, that can produce this kind of problem. But it's the best we have so far. People are working on this. Equally as problematic, and uh, a um, grading system to, uh, for which there was no consensus was a vitreous cell. However, I think grading vitreous cell to some degree is important, okay? Um, the, one of the reasons why there was no consensus is because in this grading system, which people kind of use roughly, um, you know, how are you really going to, are you really going to count 250, you know, vitreous cells? No. Um, but you are going to get an idea of, you know, how much vitreous inflammation is in the eye. The other problem is that eyes that have had previous inflammation, or eyes with PVD, sometimes can have debris in their vitreous. They can have cells in their vitreous that are, that are there co constantly that no amount of steroid is going to make go away. So particularly cells that are stuck onto vitreous fibrils are more representative of inactive inflammation as opposed to cells that may be uh, you, swirling around in the lacuna or the um, clear spaces in the vitreous uh, that are kind of swirling around in Brownian motion. Another index of activity would be kind of so-called snowballs or uh, precipitates, exudates in the vitreous cavity, such as you see here, okay, um, 
the margins of these snowballs are, uh, this one in particular, is, is not very crisp, okay? So fluffy type of snowballs would be indicative of activity as, well, as, as opposed to well-circumscribed snowball. So there are kids with intermediate EVIs that have these very well-circumscribed snowballs that are just hanging out in the inferior vitreous. 20-20 vision, no macular edema. They don't, they're not active. Okay, they've had that for a long time. However, there are, there are people with fluffy snowballs that would be indicative of activity, or people, for example, with an endogenous fungal endophthalmitis that have these fluff balls in their vitreous. That's a sign of activity. And the other thing is that when you have an inflammatory lesion in the retina or choroid, frequently there are cells over the inflammatory lesion. So I think it's, it's possible and important to actually look at that. So for example, in a patient with toxoplasmosis, with you know a biomicroscopic examination, you can actually look at the lesion, and you can tell that if you look in the anterior vitreous and then posteriorly, there there will be a collection of cells over the inflammatory lesion. So I think, in that sense, vitreous cells are important to grade. Um, the sun grading system. Just I point this out to you here because there are a couple of important concepts. Um, inactive means no no inflammation. Okay, grade of zero. However. Mo normal eyes will have a grade of less than one cell, and uh, 0.5 or, or less are generally acceptable uh, level of cellular inflammation in the eye, and it depends on the context, but that's a more nuanced decision that we can talk about in clinic. Um, but the, the goal is no inflammation, okay? Um, improved or worsened, for research purposes, you know, a two-step increase or decrease, obviously there's a ceiling and floor effect, right? You start out with one plus, and then when you go to zero, you're, you're improved. Remission. This is a problematic definition, in my opinion. Um, inactive off of treatment for greater than three months. There are diseases uh, in which uh, this just doesn't apply, okay? There are certain chronic diseases, like JIA, associated iridocyclitis, or Burchard ranocordopathy, in which this definition of remission just doesn't apply. That's a subject for another discussion, but this is what we've got. And then the idea of corticosteroid sparing um, is a very important concept. So um, we will see that you know the goal is to have patients um, steroid-free uh, or on an acceptable dose of steroids. And that dose, uh, at least in this publication, was less than 10 milligrams per day. That is going has gone down since then to probably more like five. Okay. So and the reason for that dose is that at that dose of chronic steroids, the chances of developing se serious steroid-associated side effects are very small, okay? So you want to do whatever it takes in order to get the patient off steroids, systemic steroids, for greater than three months, or get them on an acceptably low dose of steroids. And there are, there are a variety of medications that are immunomodulatory medications or uh, biological medications that we can use that are steroid-sparing, that are also anti-inflammatory to achieve that goal. Is that clear? That's an important concept. Okay, and then, you know, particularly at this time of year, you know, when we're kind of all looking at, at, uh, at patients together, oh my God, they're two plus cells. Well, maybe not, you know, maybe it's one plus. Okay, so I'm not super stickler about that because I know that there's variation, okay? And that if, as long as you're internally consistent with your grading system, that's okay. And that was actually studied and show that there's agreement within one grade of a very high percentage. So that, I think, is reassuring. So people aren't all over the map, right? Um, but you get a feel for what's, uh, what level of inflammation is significant. Okay, we talked about this. Um, why do you work up the patient at all? Um, you know, uveitis is complicated, but it's not, okay? I, I think that, on the one hand, um, you just, you want to try to keep it simple if you can, and uh, you will try, you will, I, at least, um, I, I am always thinking, is this an infection? I really don't want to get burned by, by not treating an infection, because if you treat a patient that has an infection with steroids, they will get worse, and there can be disastrous consequences of that, and there are all sorts of publications in literature about people that have injected eyes with intravitreal trimcinolone you know, with acute retinal necrosis and then toasts the eye, okay? And so we don't want to do that. So we want to make sure that there's not infection. So uh, UVI's work is important to exclude infection, 
to identify systemic disease impacting the health of the patient. That's really very important, okay? And then to guide appropriate treatment, right? So you treat an infection different than, than a non-infectious treatment. And then certain diseases um, require immunomodulation at the outset. And then to provide prognostic information for the patient, okay? So if you diagnose a patient with an HLA B27 associated spondyloarthropathy, or HLA, if you guy comes in, you know, with um, acute anterior uveitis, and you die, and you get an HLA B20 HLA typing on him, and he's B27 positive, that's important information. Okay, it doesn't really modify your treatment so much. Okay, you're going to treat him with topical steroids, but you can tell the patient, you know what, you're going to. You, your chances of having another recurrence of this is about one per year, okay? Um, we can probably treat this 90% of the time with topical steroids. And, you have, and we want to make sure, you know, based on your history, you're telling me you have back pain, okay, that bothers you in the morning. I'm concerned that maybe you have an inflammatory disease of your spine. I want you to get to see a rheumatologist. You can actually, you know, save that guy from becoming kyphotic, you know, at the age of 50 or, you know. Um, so it's important for me. Um, how do you go about, it's based, the workup, the laboratory investigation in general are based upon your history and review of systems and your degree of suspicion for certain entities. Start from, you know, basic stuff to the more exotic. Um, and then uh, always consider uh, syphilis, uh, sarcoid, or tuberculosis in the diagnosis of posterior uveitis. Okay? Always consider it. Don't always have to test for it, but think about it. Always test for syphilis. I retract that. But think about sarcoidosis or TB. And then, in the back of your mind, think, could this be a masquerade syndrome? Okay? Maybe it's not UVMS. You know, maybe it's not, maybe it's a malignancy. Okay, that's important to think about. At least have it in your head. So just a word about certain types of diseases. Okay, syphilis, if I had to order one test in the workup of UVIS, it would be an FTA. Okay, because you can cure a patient you know, with you know, penicillin with a syphilitic associated uveitis. Okay? There are basic, uh, ophthalmology has a long standing tradition of ordering both, um, F, both specific and non specific tests. So, FTA plus an RPR or VDRL test um, are important to order together. If you had to do one test, it would be an FTA. But the reason why you order them together is because the RPR and the VDRL are non specific. Okay? They can vary with treatment, so they become uh, negative with treatment, whereas the FTA remains positive for life. Okay? And if, it is not tr if the patient is not treated, it can become negative. Okay? So the patient can be, it can be untreated, still have you know, a, be, develop tertiary syphilis, and have an uh, RPR that is negative. But if their FTA is positive, then it needs to be chased down. Lyme disease, I think, is exceedingly uncommon here, um, but you know, uh, it does occur. I think we had no cases. We looked at this actually, maybe one case of Lyme disease in ten years here. We may have another, but that's another story. And uh, so, but in endemic areas or patients that are traveling from endemic areas, it's important diagnosis to consider. So, my colleagues on the East Coast frequently order Lyme serology on their patients. You will also see that there are certain there are physicians out in the community that order Lyme serology on patients for remunerative reasons, you know, for patients that are having chronic fatigue syndrome and all this kind of stuff. So it's important to sort that out and know about the test. Okay, infectious diseases, you know, um, uh, testing for uh, tuberculosis is important in certain uh, certain. Um, settings. Um, routinely screening every uveitis patient for PBD is probably not useful, it's particularly in this kind of uh, population where the um, incidence of the disease is low, right? Okay, so the positive predictive value, although the tests for PBD and for quantifying gold are sensitive and specific, the incidence of the disease in the population is low. So the positive predictive value of the test is not going to be very good. You have a lot of um, you know, false uh, results, okay? However, um, there are certain clinical clues in terms of granulomas inflammation, if the patient has nodules that are characteristic 
of a, tuber a, a coronal tuberculoma, patients with retinal vasculitis that would be suggestive of Ehlers disease, patients with serpiginous-like lesions should be tested for TB for sure. Um, certain patients with multifocal choroiditis and immunocompromised um, patients. And then there are patient factors. So immigrants, the highest, concentrate, the highest um, incidence of TB um, is associated with the elderly and with the immigrant population, HIV population, uh, patient with significant exposure risk. And then uh, prior to instituting um, systemic immunomodulatory therapy. So it's important in patients, you know, particularly if you're going to put them on systemic corticosteroids or uh, TNF inhib inhibition. There are also entities in which I think it makes sense for targeted um, testing, such as patients with a neuroretinitis. Uh, Bartonella uh, species are the most common cause of, uh, uh, of neuroretinitis. Uh, West Nile virus will be seeing some of that come September. You know, patients with multifocal choroiditis with specific uh, lesion characteristics, such as this targetoid kind of lesion that you see on the fluorescein angiogram uh, in the correct clinical context, particularly in a patient that had a history of encephalitis. PCR of the aqueous and vitreous are also uh, extremely important in sorting out viral retinitis, such as acute retinal necrosis syndrome. They are, uh, there is limited value for the routine screening serologically for, uh, for herpes and for varicella and toxoplasmosis, uh, particularly for viral, because you know, everybody's exposed to these agents. Um, and there's a high prevalence in the general population. In toxo, 25% you know, of the population is, is, ser is seropositive. A negative test for a patient that you suspect of having toxoplasmosis is, is helpful. It excludes the diagnosis. As I mentioned to you, HLA-B27 uh, in a patient with unilateral alternating recurrent anti -UVS. So the person comes in with a unilateral alternating recurrent anti -UVS, I would get an HLA-B27 test on that patient, okay? If they have chronic uveitis, I might not, right? Because 50% of these patients are, are positive, and about a quarter of these patients, or a third of them, will have an undiagnosed uh, spondyloarthropathy, okay? Um, ANA is a test, a lot of, you know, we'll see a lot of patients that come in have been referred from the outside and they have, everybody has an ANA test, okay? And it's just not the, again, the positive predictive value of that test is very, very low for screening patients with um, uveitis. In fact, um, patients with lupus frequently don't develop uveitis per se. They, they will develop retinal vasculopathy. But it is important in, in children uh, that have uh, anterior uveitis to screen them for uh, oligoticular uh, JA-associated disease. So in that context, it's important. Or in a patient that has findings that are associated with lupus. The patient comes in with a mallet rash, they have serositis, arthritis, um, those are, th that would be a patient or you know, with a vein occlusion or an arterial occlusion, I might actually uh, you know, work them up for that. Beta-2 microglobulin is actually a good screening test for a disease known as uh, tubular interstitial nephritis and uveitis. You see this in children and young women with bilateral chronic anterior uveitis. And then ANCA, rheumatoid factor, uh, and CCP are very important, particularly in patients with scleritis, uh, to exclude um, uh, Wegener's uh, granulomatosis or lapsing polychondritis. As you know, the systemic disease is associated 50% of the patients with scleritis. And, um, uh, those vasculitic conditions are extremely important to diagnose because you can, because they're associated with high mortality. Sarcoidosis, just wanted a word about sarcoid. It can produce any type of uveitis, as I mentioned before. The organs affected are predominantly the lungs, the skin, the reticular endothelial system, and the eye. Um, a lot is made up about ACE and lysozyme. They are not sp specific tests, okay? They are not useful screening tests in general for diagnostic purposes. However, um, they can be help you, put you in the ballpark of a patient, for example, that comes in with granulomous inflammation that is characteristic of sarcoidosis. I, might or I would order those tests. There are people that don't order those tests, okay? But high ACE and lysozyme are indicative of that disease, 
and they become lower when you treat the patient. Okay? There was one study that showed that high ACE and gallium scan was very highly uh, predictive for the diagnosis of, of sarcoidosis, but those are, gallium scan is not a test that we perform very often. So um, the other thing about the angiotensin converting enzyme is it can be uh, physiologically elevated in children um, and depress some patients on ACE inhibitors. So there are a lot of confounding factors. Laboratory tests that are a little bit more uh, useful uh, would be patients with uh, sarcoidosis that have hepatic involvement, which is not uncommon. So um, a complete metabolic profile in a, pa in a patient with, uh, with elevated uh, liver function tests is, and granulomas at UVS might suggest that diagnosis. Probably the most useful screening test for sarcoidosis is a chest x-ray. So 90% of patients with sarcoidosis will have some type of findings, particularly bilateral ad, uh, hyalur adenopathy in those with active diseases. In patients that have a clinical scenario that is very suggestive of sarcoidosis or uh, have granulose inflammation and their chest x-ray is negative, but you still think that they might have that, a chest CT may be a valuable test to obtain because it's more sensitive in, in uh, detecting uh, adenopathy in patients with a negative chest x-ray. Um, you know that tissue is the issue, uh, is, is um, uh, necessary for the definitive diagnosis of sarcoidosis. That being said, it can be other stuff, okay? A, granul a, uh, um, you know, a granuloma, Non-casing granuloma is not specific for sarcoidosis, okay, but uh, it puts you in that category. Um, so when when you think about that diagnostic procedure, you're always thinking, well, let's you know do a transbronchial biopsy. But there are other places that you can actually make the biopsy and spare the patient that kind of invasiveness. So look under their eyelids for a nodule, okay. Um, look on their conjunctiva for a nodule. Look on their skin, okay. So patients with sarcoidosis will have. Uh, skin findings that can be biopsied. And the lacrimal gland is also a place. Just a, a, a word you may get consulted, you know, we'd like you to do a, a non-directed conjunctival biopsy in this patient that we think has sarcoidosis. There's just no value in doing that, okay? If the patient has a nodule on their iris, you know, then I, I would think about doing that. There was a uh, international workshop on ocular sarcoidosis that kind of categorize disease into categories of definite, presumed, probable, or possible, depending upon whether or not you had a compatible UVS, whether or not there was biopsy-proven disease. So definite, obviously, biopsy-proven disease, presumed with bilateral hyalur adenopathy, but no biopsy, probable with a compatible UVS with uh, three signs and two laboratory investigations. So those have about a 60% chance of having disease. And I just wanted to point out some of the signs that you might see in a patient with sarcoidosis. So you have on gonioscopy these tent-like PAS that are very characteristic. So these are characteristic clinical signs. Um, you can have these granulomas of the optic nerve. You can have a, a uh, periphlebitis, collections of inflammatory exudates in the inferior uh, retina, and not infrequently characteristic white kind of uh, quarter retinal spots. So these are all signs that you see in patients with sarcoid. Um, moving away from sarcoid, but in general, uh, in terms of your work of the patient, as I mentioned to you, chest x-ray is important, not only for sarcoid, but for TB and for other diseases, such as uh, uh, Wegener's, in which you may have cavitory lesions in the lung. Again, CT and MRI scan uh, for TB, lymphoma, toxoplasmosis, and MS. Uh, B-scan, you wouldn't want to have a surgical misadventure in this eye. Always a good idea to, um, you know, B-scan patients with med media opacity to see what's going on in the back of their eye. And then UBM is actually very useful in detecting uh, um, maybe causes of hypotony. So hypotony is a really bad complication of long-term uh, inflammation in the eye. Very, very difficult to treat, but in some cases you can treat it, okay? Particularly if you can identify a cyclitic membrane that is uh, pulling on the ciliary body, uh, detachment of the ciliary body. And then you can also kind of, you know, say, well, ciliary body shot, okay, if the ciliary processes are, are, are atrophic, and you can identify that on UVM. And your approach would be different. You wouldn't be treating patient 
uh, surgically or with inflammation. Then multimodal imaging is really key in uh, assessing inflammation in the posterior segment of patients with uveitis. Fluorescein angiography, you will, will hear a lot about fluorescein angiography and OCT angiography, which is coming and will be a very important tool. But I, I will tell you that fluorescein angiography is here to stay in, in, the, uh, in the assessment of patients with inflammatory disease. And I think will be, still be very useful in, the, in patients with, uh, with neovascular uh, AMD in certain cases, but certainly in patients with inflammatory diseases because it gives you, you know, an idea of what's happening physiologically in the patient. So the assessment of CME may be, uh, you know, better served by OCT, but certainly retinal and choroidal nevascularization, vasculitis, non-perfusion, all these things can, are complications of patients with, uh, with inflammatory disease and require fluorescein angiography. And wide field fluorescein angiography is becoming particularly useful and confounding. I think, in, uh, in how we approach and make management decisions. Again, ICG angiography, not a lot of application for ICG angiography these days, I think, in retinal diseases. There are a couple of retinal entities for which it's really important, like PCV or, um, or even some RAP, RAP lesions in the retina, but for many cord retinal lesions, ICG angiography is important, okay? It can help you diagnostically, for example, in patients with certain types of white dot syndromes and patients with uh, Birdshot retinal cordopathy. Um, you know, OCT is uh, extremely useful, particularly in differentiating inflammatory versus, you know, tractional macular edema, um, but also gives us a lot of information about what's going on in the outer retina these days, particularly important in patients with visual loss associated with um, white dot syndromes and, uh, and seeing, you know, what's happening in the outer retina and seeing what's reversible and what's not reversible. Um, and then the assessment of the choroid is becoming useful, uh, increasingly important and uh, useful in monitoring uh, disease activity and response to treatment. So for example, um, patients with VKH will have uh, very thickened choroids, okay? And then when you treat them, the choroids become thinner. And then likewise, uh, autofluorescence, um, is, I think, useful particularly in patients that have inflammatory conditions that affect the outer retina and the pigment epithelium. Um, we don't exactly know what the significance of a lot of these findings can be sometimes, but hyper-autofluorescence is frequently indicative of disease activity. And what is interesting about, about that is that uh, the hyperfluorescence can occur remotely from the area of active inflammation, and it will be modulated with treatment. I just want to, okay, so I still have a lot of stuff to talk about in terms of treatment. So this is, that's basically the approach to diagnosis, okay? Um, I can give you kind of a, we've got about 10 minutes and I can, I, I'll keep going here uh, about treatment because I think I just, it's the treatment goal, it's not the specifics of the agents and things like that that's important, but it's really the approach that I'd like to give you a, kind of a, a handle for. So what's the goal of treatment? It's basically to have your cake and eat it, okay? That is, eliminate inflammation um, to prevent complications, okay, uh, and to avoid toxicity. And I think it's achievable in a lot of cases. So what's, so what's the important thing? It sounds fundamentally you know, simplistic, but you have to have a diagnosis, right? So you want to uh, know you want to know if you're treating infection or non-infection, and then you want to have a diagnosis because there are certain disease-specific indications for treatment. Okay, so a patient with Bechet's disease with vasculitis needs immunomodulation at the outset. Okay, a patient with B27 associated disease needs topical steroids. Okay, so it's important to have that. Okay. Um, Step ladder algorithm, just in general, um, treat, the, the idea is to put the fire out, okay, with a fire hose, all right, not, you know, a water pistol, um, and that is to use uh, whatever it takes uh, to get the inflammation under control, okay, so if you're dealing with a non-infectious agent, uh, non-infectious uveitis, use steroids, um, 
by whatever means necessary and by whatever route is necessary to get inflammation under control for a limited period of time. Okay, so for anterior segment inflammation, topical steroids, um, periocular steroids for patients with macular edema or intermediate uveitis, um, and then brief systemic corticosteroids. Um, I put this oral non-steroidal anti-inflammatory medication there only because it is u- useful sometimes in patients that are have an indication for the use of these medications. For so, so for example, patients that are that have a spondyloarthropathy that are on a systemic non-steroidal. Okay, then to have a low threshold to introduce steroid sparing immunomodulation. Okay, so the patient is um, not responding uh, to steroids. Rethink your diagnosis, number one. But if they, you cannot um, taper them down to an acceptable dose, then have a low threshold for employing these agents. Then there is local therapy that is extremely affected, effective, such as flucinolone implants, okay, um, but comes at a price of significant complications, okay, including cataract and incisional glaucoma surgery. Um, so the route and choice of medication is determined by the, you know, location anatomically and the laterality of the inflammation and the systemic health of the patient, right? So here are our options, right? Topical steroids can be used pretty much, are used for anterior uveitis, but they can be used for anterior uveitis associated with any of these entities, right? Periocular steroids um, are frequently used in patients with intermediate uveitis, particularly because uh, because um, topical steroids will not penetrate to the back of the eye. Periocular steroids are useful for intermediate uveitis um, and in patients with macular edema, particularly unilateral disease. Okay? Um, but they are also very useful as adjunctive therapy in patients with posterior pan uveitis and in patients that are on systemic therapy with immunomodulation that may have recurrences of inflammation that you may want to just treat that blip. Okay? And then you have implantable steroids, systemic steroids, and immunomodulation. So those are the options. Topical therapy, I'm not going to say a lot about it. You know, it's just um, treat with high doses. Don't start out with BID, right? Start out with, uh, start out with a high dose of steroids for inflammation, and then get the inflammation under control, and then taper. Okay? Um, there is limited delivery to the posterior segment, may, with the exception possibly, in patients that have vitrectomized eyes, okay, in which potent steroids may be actually useful, for example, in the treatment of macular edema. Okay. So dipropredonate may have better penetration. As I said to you, start out high and then taper. Um, use cycloplegia in patients uh, that have significant anterior segment inflammation. Um, there's controversy as to what agent to use. Um, the, idea, the reason for using cyclopegia is one for pain to uh, decrease ciliary spasm in patients with severe anterior segment inflammation and also to prevent uh, posterior sneaky formation. So I prefer to use an agent that moves the pupil. So atropine will keep the patient in a dilated state for two weeks. Uh, so if a patient has significant inflammation, I would be more uh, inclined to treat them with homatropine or cyclopentylate to move the pupil. Um, we know that you know this is associated with cataract and elevated intraocular pressure, and that more potent steroids are more apt to give that to put the patient at risk for that. And there are steroid preparations that are at lower risk, such as rimexolone. Systemic steroids are also have a, a lower risk of um, cataract and elevated intraocular pressure. Uh, periocular steroids are very useful for acute remitting non-infectious intermediate posterior pan uveitis, as I mentioned to you before, as primary therapy or adjunctive therapy, and, uh, and particularly in uh, patients with uveitic macular edema. There are a number of ways you can deliver it. You can deliver it as a uh, posterior subtenance injection, or an orbital floor injection, as you can see here. The approaches are equivalent in terms of their efficacy. Um, in general, uh, you, uh, you can uh, obtain resolution of inflammation about 60 to 65 percent of the time. It lasts for about three months. Um, there's visual improvement in about half of the patient, and there's additional benefit for a second injection. At least the literature suggests that 85 percent of the patients will improve with a second injection. 
This, of course, depends on the individual patient, right? So you're not going to say, well, you know, every patient I have, I'm going to give them a second injection. It really depends on how they respond. Okay. Um, again, cataract and intraocular pressure elevation are uh, always problems associated with uh, local steroid injections. Um, periocular and retro bulbar hemorrhage. There are certain specific side effects associated with delivery modes. So patients with um, subtenons injection will be more apt to develop ptosis okay, and lid retraction, whereas patients with, orbital, with the orbital floor injection will have uh, orbital herniation more frequently. I think orbital herniation is probably a better side effect to have than, than ptosis, but, you know, and it's also easier to deliver in the clinic, but they're both not great. We can inject steroids into the eye intravitrally. Um, as you know, the complications include endophthalmitis, is the worst complication, cataract and ocular hypertension, which occur, can occur in about 25% of patients after one injection. Um, cataract usually ensues after about four injections of intravitreal steroids. We now have a you know bio uh, erodible uh, copolymer. You know, the Osrodex injection, which is the dexamethasone uh, implanted, it's been approved for the treatment of uh, inflammation, uh, intermediate and posterior UVI, but also for macular edema associated with uh, diabetes and vein inclusions. Uh, the post uh, marketing surveillance suggests that uh, it is not quite as effective as, you know, the, uh, in the label indications. That is, that. Um, uh, it's labeled as a six-month kind of treatment, but really uh, the clinical experience suggests that it's more, more like a three-month uh, efficacy that, um, yes, cataract does occur, okay, in about 10 to 15% of patients, and yeah, intraocular pressure does occur, but maybe at less frequency than uh, patients with intravitreal corticosteroids. Um, so the durability is still about th three months, uh, requires multiple injections. It's particularly useful in eyes that are vitrectomized, Okay? Uh, because it doesn't have the dispersive effect that, say, triamcinolone would in a vitrectomized eye. A word of caution, you want to make sure that it would be contraindicated, relatively, well, contraindicated in an eye with, that's aphakic, or in, and you need to be kind of circumspect in eyes that have open posterior capsules. Sometimes these implants can migrate into the anterior segment and produce significant corneal edema. If it does happen, they need to be removed. They, you just can't watch them. Um, the problem with regional corticosteroids is that they are relatively, relatively short-acting, okay? So just, just to make sure that we're on the same page, this is, there is no one-size-fits-all for every patient, right? Okay? So um, there are patients that you can give a periocular steroid to that have intermediate uveitis once a year that do fine, okay? That's, that's pretty much how I'd manage that patient. But there are patients that don't, okay? There are patients that require multiple injections. So it's relatively short acting. It's less effective for, for patients with chronic inflammation. So the problem with chronic inflammation with a um, corticosteroid injection is that you have this kind of intermittent pulse, right? So you're treating them for a while, they get worse. Treating them for a while, they get worse. And you can have this, with each kind of recurrence of inflammation, this sawtooth kind of decline in retinal function. So you don't want to treat patients that way, in my judgment. Plus, you have the cumulative effect of cataract and, and glaucoma. You can use, there's an implantable device, a Redisert device that has been approved, you know, for patients with uh, uveitis uh, and was quite effective uh, in reducing recurrence as compared to the fellow eye, reduction of adjunctive therapy, and frequent adverse effects. So cataracts in fake guys, 100% of patients get cataracts. 70% of patients have ocular hypertension, 40% of patients required incisional surgery. So it may not be the best first option, okay, for a young person with intermediate uveitis that's phagic, that has reasonable vision, because you need to tell that patient, yep, you're gonna get, you know, at least two surgeries, maybe three. But on the other hand, if you have a patient that has terrible disease, that just will not take immunomodulation or cannot tolerate corticosteroids, it's a very good option, okay? Or in patients that you can't get approved for a medication, or this is a $20,000 device, by the way, or patients that um, 
just are not doing as well uh, on systemic cortical steroid therapy. So again, it needs to be individualized to the patient. Um, the flucinolone acetonide introvert, introvert insert has been approved for diabetic macular edema. It's coming for uveitis. Okay? So there's another option for intravigital injection. This is a bioerodible polymer. So you still have this polyamide cylinder that's hanging out in the vitreous. It lasts for about two and a half years and has similar uh, side effect profile, but not as bad as the register insert because the concentration of drug is less. Um, just intravitreal methotrexate has actually been studied in inflammation. Um, there is only one really good center that has been looking at it, and we're actually trying to look at this now. Okay, uh, it, it has been useful in the control of inflammation and in the reduction of macular edema, and has placed certain patients into extended remission. I personally have not had that experience, but I'm open to this as, uh, as an agent in patients that don't um, respond well. So we're conducting a clinical trial for macular edema in which one of the arms is intravitreal methotrexate. Systemic corticosteroids you know have multiple side effects, okay, drive you and the patient crazy, uh, but I think that corticosteroids are actually manageable, okay, most of the time uh, if you know what you're doing with the patient, if you define the period of time that you're going to treat the patient with, um, and uh, you uh, manage the side effects appropriately. So every patient that is on corticosteroids for more than six weeks requires adjunctive treatment with vitamin D and calcium. Okay? You need to weigh the patient to keep them honest, okay? so, because weight gain is a, it's a major side effect, but it's not compulsory. So you can counsel the patient to not eat high caloric food. Um, uh, you need to check their lipids and uh, bone densitometry annually. Um, just guidelines about the use of immunosuppressive drugs. So you've tried you know, steroids and they're just not working. Okay? So patients that fail steroids, patients that have unacceptable side effects of steroids, or diseases we know are poorly responsive to corticosteroids, I'll review them in a second, or requirement for, for corticosteroids that's greater than 7.5 milligrams per day require immunomodulation, okay? Um, those diseases at which, for which immunomodulation is commenced at the onset of therapy include Bechet's disease with retinal vasculitis, ocular cicatricial um, uh, mucous membrane pemphigoid, serpiginous chordopathy, necrotizing scleritis, and sympathetic ophthalmia. There are a whole bunch of other diseases in which the early implementation of these diseases, uh, implementation of these medications is, is important for the long-term uh, treatment of these patients as they have very long-term type of uh, inflammation. Those include patients with birdshot, multifocal cordias, BKH, some patients with intermediate uveitis, and JIA-associated iridocyclitis. Just to kind of give you broad categories, it will stop. There's, I think it's important to think about immunomodulation in two large kind of categories. There's conventional treatment, and then there's biological treatment, okay? Conventional treatment consists of the group of medication, the anti-metabolites, which include methotrexate, which is kind of first-line treatment, mycophenolate, or, um, or um, Celsept, and azathioprine. There are T-cell transduction inhibitors, uh, such as cyclosporin and tacrolimus, which can be used as add-on therapy because their, their mechanism is different. And then the alkylating agents, which are much more potent medications that are used a lot less frequently, such as chlorambucil and cyclophosphamide, that carry the risk of significant side effects and actually increase malignancy and mortality. The, the, the flip side of that is that those are the medications that can induce permanent remissions more often. Um, I will go over this stuff in more detail the next time we meet, okay? But um, I just wanted you to show you that there's a large study that looked at the, it's a retrospective study at these agents, and they, the um, anti-metabolites, azathioprine, methotrexate, mycophenolate, all work pretty much the same in terms of their efficacy, their steroid sparing capability, and their toxicity. Their remission rate is very, very low, as opposed to um, cytotoxic medication, 
uh, in which they are more effective, but the trade-off is that the toxicity is quite high. Okay. Um, we'll get into this stuff later. I hope this provides oh the um, yeah then there are the biological agents. Okay. Uh, so non-conventional therapy. There's a whole host of new medications in the pipeline, some of which we use routinely now, um, biological response modifiers that are therapeutic proteins that are bioengineered as antagonists to Im immunoactive molecules. Okay? These are usually recombinant antibodies um, that can block cytokines, cytokine receptors, cell surface proteins, or other bioactive proteins. The idea is to provide a more targeted, more specific therapy and decrease side effects. That's the hope of that. Okay, and there are pretty much uh, two of them that are used frequently in our clinic, infliximab uh, and adalimumab that are TNF inhibitors. They're different in that infliximab is a chimeric molecule, mouse human monoclonal antibodies delivered by, by IV infusion as, as opposed to adalimumab, which, a, which is a humanized molecule that can be deliver, delivered subcutaneously. Um, there are advantages to and disadvantages to the use of both of these medications. This can be more titratable. There's more leeway in terms of the dosing frequency and, and the dose, uh, whereas this is more of a fixed dose. And just to let you know that this was recently, I mean, like a couple of weeks ago, approved uh, by the FDA for use in UVIs. Um, there are a whole lot of other biological comments that we'll talk about later that uh, we're kind of, kind of borrowing from you know, our colleagues in rheumatology and in hematology that have been tested actually in limited fashions that some of which show promise, some of which have had really disastrous kind of results, okay, or have not met any kind of primary endpoint. So the, the bottom line is that biological agents and new therapies are out there. They're being developed. People are really looking at them as with new modalities that come in every there's a lot of enthusiasm initially but I think that one needs to maintain a critical eye uh, it is not a panacea these are non remittive agents that is they're not curing disease okay and frequently they will have their efficacy will wane in time so there's still a lot of, a lot of uh, room for uh, study in UVIs therapeutically certainly mechanistically and it remains challenging. So this is kind of an overview of stuff, um, and uh, we'll get into specifics, you know, in the following lectures. I would be happy to go over this in more detail with you um, at our next lecture. Okay, thanks a lot. Thanks.